welcome to the Evolving Past Alzheimer's podcast, where we are focused on bringing you information to help prevent and reverse brain diseases like Alzheimer's and other dementias. I'm Dr. Nate Bergman, a functional medicine physician in Cleveland, Ohio, and your host on this journey. So, whether you're a baby boomer who's worried that your brain wiring just isn't working like it once was, or you have loved ones with the disease, or you yourself have already been diagnosed and are wondering, what do I do now? You'll want to listen to this podcast. Each episode, we introduce you to the top doers and thinkers that are revisioning Alzheimer's and dementia. If you have questions or comments or just want to connect, please check us out on our Facebook page, or if you're old-fashioned like me, Google Evolving Past Alzheimer's Podcast, and you'll find us that way. So here we go. Let's get better. Welcome back to the show. Uh, We're going to take a little different turn this week and perhaps take a look into what the future might be. Uh, We're glad to have with us Ira Pastor, uh, Chief Executive Officer of BioQuark. Ira's have over 30 years of experience across multiple sectors in the pharmaceutical industry. He's currently a board member of Regenerage, a clinical company focused on expedited translational therapeutic applications of regenerative and rejuvenative healthcare interventions. He's on the board of Reanima Project and a member of the World Economic Forum's Health Enhancement Council. So a little different, and I'm excited to talk. Welcome to the show, Ira. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure. So you have this really interesting background in the pharmaceutical industry and you know decades of experience, leadership positions, uh, done all types of deals and uh, kind of big deals. And you know I, I don't want to spend a lot of time with an intro because I, I read something about your company, BioQuark. There, you know, there's articles out there saying that your company thinks it may have a say in reversal of brain death. And is that, is that right? You know, how can that possibly be? Uh, I, you know, I felt like my imagination was bent. We're a show here focused mostly on Alzheimer's and, and traumatic brain injury and, and, and things that contribute to kind of dementias and especially as people move forward in life. And when I read that, um, you know, the, the possible reversal of brain death, I was like, wow, you know, not many companies are making that claim. Is this like, you know, is this real? Yeah, I mean, this is a, uh, you refer to the Reanima project. It was conceived as a exploratory program uh, designed to target an area of biomedical research that has really gotten very little attention or research dollars, that matter of years, namely the so-called severe disorders of consciousness, which have, you know, the theme uh, has become much more popular with some of the high-profile cases in the U.S. over the last couple of years, including those of uh, Jaime Math and Robbie Christina Brown. Uh, on top of that, you know, a lot of people are unaware of it. The area of so-called living cadaver research, which has you know, quietly gone on in many countries for decades now, including the United States, for things like studying uh, toxicology and pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics and so forth, in uh, recently see subjects um, happens. And we basically, you know, the fact that we are a regenerative medicine company that focuses on studying epimorphic regeneration. So, you know, looking at all the wonderful species that have this planet with us, who's among their skills uh, happens to be uh, substantial central nervous system regeneration, even in certain instances where the brain is, you know, sliced out in a way, um, where the brain comes back and regrows in perfect stern function, and basically putting these things together and saying, you know what, there may be a space here, is obviously not part of the company, uh, we are interested <laughs> in the disease of the living, but at the same time, we have this opportunity to study what is really the best model out there for complex uh, neuroregeneration, vascular regeneration in the brain. Uh, so it is a project that is uh, niche, <laughs> it's a little unusual, uh, but we feel the trickle-down learnings uh, from something like this to things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and trying to brain injury and so forth will be invaluable. Uh, so we think it is a important part of the glow picture yeah. of regeneration uh, that we need to study. Okay, so that's interesting. So it's sort of midway in, in the answer there. You began to talk a little bit about what your company is doing, and I uh, understand that it's in the kind of the business of biologics and more specifically combinatory biologics. And you've taken some ideas from what we see in so-called nature 
uh, and other species and other animal organisms or life forms um, and are thinking about applying this to humans. Is, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. The concept of the, the principle of epimorphic regeneration, which you know, commonly uh, are, you know, thought about uh, in the amphibian kingdom, um, obviously most of the audience is well aware that many members of uh, the amphibian realm, salamanders, boots, and so forth, can replace lost or damaged organs and tissues that are identical uh, in both structure and function to the original ones perfectly throughout a lifetime. Uh, these include spinal cords, limbs, large segments of the heart, eyeballs, uh, even large segments of the brain, which can be destroyed only to deform perfectly again. So we have been very interested in studying the dynamics and thinking a little differently uh, than our my former colleagues and friends in the pharmaceutical industry do, which are so interested in this, the so-called single magic bullet for diseases. But when you look at something like epimorphic regeneration, which is so very complex, uh, involving reprogramming cells to a, uh, an early progenitor state, targeted histolytic events for extracellular matrix modeling, uh, activity of the regenerative dynamics of the innate immune system. Uh, there's a lot going on, and this is clearly something that is not going to be addressable with a single magic bullet, the little white pill that pharma like 3 8. So we have to think a little differently, and we use our combinatorial approaches, thinking more about, you know, what are the different things that we can combine, the different approaches, sort of how we've approached HIV cocktails or multi-drug chemotherapy protocols in the last couple of decades, and how we think about things a little differently uh, than the traditional pharmaceutical industry likes to think about things. Uh, and then that is the direction we've been going in, and specifically, looking at biochemical dynamics uh, that are found in ooplasms, because it's here, and you know, this is also sort of the one area in, in humans where we find these types of abilities to an estimate, turn back time, uh, reset age, clean up genetic damage, model organelles, all the interesting things that have to go into uh, starting over in that, so taking a cell that is at stage B and going back to state A uh, and, and starting life over again. Uh, well. So you figured out how to essentially hack an egg. Is that what you're saying? And use it to almost reverse engineer several processes that are contributing to degeneration, cellular degeneration, organ degeneration. Do I have that correct? Absolutely. Because, you know, uh, plasma-based reprogramming um, dynamics have been known since 1950s uh, in terms of the original cloning experiments and digitalization, uh, egg-free constitution experiments in the 1970s. And uh, John Burden, I just got the Nobel Prize for this stuff in 2012, but it's all about the Petri dish. And we basically said, you know, we want to move beyond the Petri dish. We, we don't want to be a, a research tool. We don't want to be a stem cell company. We really want to like they're for these signals, which are so very powerful. I mean, they're, they're what creates stem cells in the first place and creates, you know, New life, how we can really find interesting bioactive materials there that can be biologics. Uh, so yes, you hit it on that. Hacking the egg. So, so can you just also, in a sort of simple way, define how a biologic is different? And certainly there's a lot of examples of biologics on the market already, uh, but it, the difference between a biologic, a drug, and let's say a stem cell... Yeah, I'm not aware of all the other things. If you're on nature, basically we find FDA uh, or EMA in Europe as a drug substance that is either polypeptide or carbohydrate based or combination of polypeptide and carbohydrate is extracted from a living organism and has a very complex physiochemical structure that is not defined by a new chemical entity. So in essence, the manufacturing process in many cases define the product as opposed to actual composition. When you think of a traditional drug, you are focused on a specific drug entity, a drug structure uh, that may be primarily chemical in nature, uh, and that product is primarily defined by its physiochemical structure. A stem cell, technically, uh, which is a pluripotent cell that has a lot of potential to become many different cell lineages, uh, one of 200 plus that the body is made up of. Technically, uh, also falls under the biologic class, but there are obviously some different rules uh, and criteria and so forth that the FDA looks at when looking at stem cells. But we are primarily, when we talk about biologics, we are primarily talking about either the polypeptide or polypeptide combination-based products uh, that have been 
defined per FDA for you know, since the 1920s when it was first created. Okay, excellent. Do you have an example, like a prototype product that's worked? You know what I mean? Something that's worked, whether it's in animals or in humans, uh, or kind of where where you're at in the uh, development of sort of pipeline of this technology. Yeah, absolutely. So we have, uh, there's three major pillars that we've been focusing on as a company. Uh, Central nervous system is extreme importance to us, oncology. And uh, so a lot of work still uh, preclinical uh, in large models, but examples of the work we're doing in uh, cancer, we've been focusing on how one reprograms and turns a tumor uh, back into normal tissue. Uh, this is how most species that are very cancer resistant and cancer resilient uh, in nature deal with cancer. They don't focus on the kill events like we do, they focus on the chain events. So we've had a lot of initial success in uh, models, including melanoma. Adenocarcinoma of the breast. Uh, a lot of the not just look at changes, uh, shrinking of tumor, but also in a lot of the uh, biomarkers of tumor invasiveness, uh, copy expression, INOS expression, and so forth that are involved in metastatic, metastatic processes. So this is one area that we've been very active in the lab. Secondarily, we very active in uh, the brain injury model, uh, looking also at the sort of the gross anatomical changes uh, that occur when impact occurs to the brain, but also in a lot of the biologic changes, the uh, expression of things like uh, precursor beta amyloid proteins and so forth that are turned on after uh, brain injury uh, and how we can, uh, using our processes, not just regenerate parts of the brain, but also uh, to the gene expression of these factors that yield worse prognosis when they're hyperdressed and so forth. So this has been very exciting for us. In terms of some of the uh, first in human work, we have begun to get some of our, our feet wet in the very early stage sort of phase one type dose ranging work with partners XUS uh, and have begun a little work in the area of spinal cord injury. And that's been very exciting for us, uh, not just in the perspective of some of the initial sort of signs of biologic activity in humans, but also just for the long-term safety and tolerability data that we've uh, started to generate. And obviously, biologics are a little different than synthetic chemicals. Uh, they have unique profile and properties that make them a little safer. We still have to look at things like exaggerated pharmacologies and genicity and so forth because we are dealing with proteins, but we are beginning to generate a very nice uh, little set of data on that front as well. So we still a rather early age, but nonetheless, moving forward on uh, several pillars that are important for the property. Okay, yeah, it would be certainly exciting to see if we could, if you guys could figure out something for all, Alzheimer's. You know, we we are focused sort of on a molecular level in our work, and it's kind of the network of people that we do the same sort of thing that we do, but it's very focused on sort of proteomics and kind of the molecular basis for uh, Alzheimer's and other sort of brain conditions. But there is, seems to be, and we don't know this for sure, but just observation, you know, just observations in the clinic, there seems to be a point at which uh, so much brain tissue function or network function is lost that the, the mo- sort of molecular revival doesn't appear to be possible right now. And, you know, when people lose independence or they really have gone declined very, very quickly. Although you know, there are some reports of people uh, improving out of those states, for the most part, we, we don't yet see that. So something that is a that can reach further into the brain, the nervous system of someone that has uh, significantly more tissue damage and loss of function is very, very exciting. Um, the kind of technologies, what kind of technologies do you have to use? A, to figure out these networks then B, I would assume because you're, you're sort of using, you're using this kind of top down approach of uh, you're not focusing on the inflammation, the oxidative stress, some of the, the basic mechanisms that are attributed to aging and degeneration, but you're focused on, on sort of much more, I would call it higher order mechanisms of degeneration. Do you need special informatics, special types of technologies? I mean, what are the technologies in general that are, that you need to use? I mean, is it just basic science or do you have, do you have, do you need supercomputing capacity and what kind of technologies do you employ to figure out the mechanisms and then to design and derive design and deliver these treatments? 
I mean, we're just seeing rather traditional tools today. I mean, we're not involved uh, yet in the, you know, artificial intelligence or machine learning, anything of this nature. Um, we have a uh, we have partnerships on the proteomics front where we study a lot of, uh, you know, the protein dynamics and microRNA arrays. But a lot of what we do is just very traditional and sort of the mechanistic front. A lot of traditional cell assays and it just really at this point, I mean, many of action when it comes to some of these. Uh, complex or more complex, uh, let's say, um, is it's a career in itself. And, and we're more or less taking perspective that MOA is important. Obviously, mechanisms and and you know, farm is driven by mechanism of action, but motives are important as well. And it comes to something as complex as spinal cord regeneration or limb regeneration. So we don't care much about mechanism. We do, but as I said, the complexity of the situation at this point in time. There may be things we don't know for many years. I think that's okay uh, when it comes to some of these conditions. As you know, um, being a clinician, you know, how many, what percent of all FDA products nowadays, the location package insert, the physician insert, mechanism of action is unknown. Uh, many, but <laughs> a large percentage. And so we are very interested in, at the same time, uh, we have to keep our eye and, and on the bigger eyes and, and in our perspective that is, you know, as you said, sort of this higher order dynamic uh, that, you know, doesn't come naturally, let's say, to the lingo that is normally bantered out the pharmaceutical industry, but is increasingly important, is increasingly making its way into sort of the cis biology realm. Uh, these new disciplines of analyzing you know, mathematical biology and sort of state space transitions and the concept of biological attractors. Uh, these are all things that you know, they sit above the genes. They are higher order biodynamic components of downstream effects and whether that is inflammation or oxidation, or heat shock or epigenetic gate transitions. Uh, that's all well in good, but we are comfortable at this point in time, in fact, it is earlier on, that we want to master the picture. We'll worry more about mechanisms later. Sure. Absolutely. I understand that. So it makes sense. And certainly there, like you mentioned, there's many, many medications on the market that seem to have been effective in clinical trials. I mean, they work, but we don't really know why. Uh, it was based on some, you know, a concept, uh, but and, and it seemed to pan out in clinical trials, safety trials, and, you know, trials of many more people, as you, as you well know, working in the pharmaceutical industry for decades. And of course, yeah, we don't, uh, we don't actually know how or why they work uh, other than sort of generally. Wow. So I guess one of my last questions here is just what, how far do you think that we are, that you are, and others, other companies maybe similar to yours, to finding a solution, uh, even if it's, a, if it's only part of a solution or it's the beginning of a solution, but but some direct to consumer, direct to patient, you know, maybe through their doctor or, or however they get it. But how far do you, you think you are to a clinical solution for Alzheimer's? Uh, I w- I'll go on the record saying within, within the next five years. Uh, we are quite confident uh, just because of the sort of the more universal nature of what we're involved in, in the sense that we, we are not downstream, we're not looking at another genomic output of the disease, but realizing that uh, Alzheimer's doesn't fall out of the sky. Uh, it is a continuum. It is a, uh, like most other diseases we are now finding out in the sort of the realm of system biology, it is a drastic transition. It happens over time, but it is more complex than just an inflammatory target or another, you know, neuro factor. Uh, it is a transition that happens metabolic, inflammatory, but happens early on and transitions through complex state of affairs. And if we can focus on sort of the generic sort of reprogramming of that state, whether that's state E, F, or G, and going back to state A and starting over with fresh new tissue, cleansed, epigenetically reset, Organelles remodeled, morphogenetic regeneration occurring. We think we have a major impact on a wide range of central nervous system disorders simultaneously. Uh, and we are now, this isn't the case, and we have to develop something for Alzheimer's and, you know, will it work? Parkinson's? No, but yeah, now in our case, uh, it's, more, it's more universal in our strategy. So we think we are a lot closer. Simultaneously, we made the decision early on when we set this company, we were not going to base this on 
more futuristic tools that invest in million dollars a pop. You know, some of these gene editing therapies and, and other tools that are coming down the pipe right now. It didn't make any sense. Uh, create therapies that only a couple thousand people planning for. And so this is why we've taken a 21st century thinking, but are applying more 20th century biologicals to the problem. And I think when you put those two things together, sort of the biological and then at the same time sort of the pharmacoeconomic component of this space, which is very important, I think we're going to have some very important solutions in the short term. Wow. This is not another third way. So exciting. Ira, uh, thank you so much for your time. This is Ira Pastor from the company BioCork. Uh, you can find them o- online. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time, Ira. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So that's our episode. I hope you guys got something out of that. Check the show notes out on iTunes or on our website where we've summarized the key points. If you have questions or comments or just want to connect, please check us out on our Facebook page. Or if you're old-fashioned like me, Google Evolving Past Alzheimer's Podcast, and you'll find us that way. Finally, if you find the information here valuable, please consider giving us a five-star rating on iTunes and leaving comments in the comment section. It will really help us bring this message to as many people as we can. Thanks, and talk to you next time. Thank you.